Hi everyone, I'm Willis from Tech in Asia. Today, I have with me Adash, partner and head of digital practice at Bain and Company Southeast Asia, Stephanie, vice president, Google Southeast Asia, and Rohit, chief investment strategist at Tomasic. So very happy to be speaking with all of you about the latest economy Southeast Asia report, which came out recently. So hi everyone. So uh, all right. The audience probably hasn't had a chance to dig deep into the report. So again, very quickly, how did Southeast Asia digital economy fare? I just want to ask all of you, A, being excellent, B, good, C, possible, and D, terrible. Did we do well? How and why? So maybe we can start off with Rohit. Well, I think I'll have to give it uh, a B plus. And the reason for that is if you look at where we were at the beginning of this year and what we expected from the net economy in 2020, it was clearly a disappointment and therefore probably a B minus. But uh, given the fact that you had the pandemic in the context of that, I think it was an A or even an A plus. And I say that because it was really a life savior uh, to the, the internet economy was a life savior to everyone out here. It allowed students to sort of continue with their education, it allowed people to access doctors when they needed it. It allowed people sitting at home to be able to get groceries, uh, other necessities when they wanted it, allowed a lot of small businesses to keep the lights on and continue to interact with their customers. So really, and, and the good part is that I think every player in the internet economy in Southeast Asia really stepped up and wasn't really focused on maximizing profits during the period, it was really focusing on making sure that users could get what they needed. So really in that context, it was a true A plus performance out there. So on balance, maybe a B plus, uh, but I think in the context of the internet economy uh, and what we saw in the pandemic, I would say an A plus. Awesome. Um, Stephanie, your view. Yes, I think I'm gonna to have to follow in Rohit's footsteps here and uh, give it a good uh, overall. Uh, I'll, I'll provide maybe just a slightly different uh, perspective for the same, uh, same rating. If we look inside of uh, the digital economy, we see that some sectors performed excellently, like e-commerce, it grew 63% year on year. So 2020 was the year of e-com. But at the same time, there were some sectors that declined year on year. Online travel is one of them, declined by 58%. But that's understood, right? Uh, it's been uh, impacted by, by COVID. But if you take these you know, growers and some that declined year on year, in the end, it balances out. And like Rohit said, against a backdrop of declining GDP and industry declines, the digital economy held steady in Southeast Asia. And that's not just good in my opinion, but it's resilient. Nice, and Adash? Uh, you know, a lot, lot of uh, great, great themes already pointed out uh, by by uh, Rohit and Stephanie. I, I would give it an A plus. You know, outright excellent. <laughs> I have absolutely uh, nothing negative to say. But I think the the reason is, um, uh, you know, the, just the the lens, right? So if if I take the the long view, uh, which is you know, this is a is a gradually growing or or a fast growing sector over a five six year view. Uh, it's just been in very, very impressive how resilient uh, the digital players are are in Southeast Asia. And and I say this comparing to, you know, other parts of the world where we've had, you know, uh, disruptions in service, you know, people being locked out of their accounts in, in some of the fintech players in, in Europe, uh, you know, lots of issues with the, you know, with the gig economy in terms of, uh, you know, protections, et cetera, in U.S. In Southeast Asia, it's just been incredible. The entire ecosystem has come together uh, to deliver us services through the lockdown and all of the businesses are, are really working hard to, you know, uh, uh, meet the exceedingly high demands of all of us as consumers. So if I take the, if take the long view, you know, every year there will be some ups and downs in some years that our, our growth projections will, you know, be overshot. Some, they won't meet expectations, but uh, what, what is very, very heartening is that it's uh, extremely resilient. And uh, that's, uh, uh, for me, an A+. Plus. Very nice. So in terms of like resilience, if I can just summarize, I think everyone gave an A plus. Uh, yeah, I think that that would be my rating as well. But in terms of growth, of course, like due to COVID, uh, it would be more like a B. So I think overall, we, we're, we're, you know, I think we did great. Of course, like things weren't exactly looking very good earlier this year. Everyone was uh, in panic mode. 
Uh, but it looks like this pandemic has actually made us stronger. So beyond what we can see, I think there are several interesting trends, right? Um, increasing usage of food delivery and online content. Um, the pandemic, can you tell us how the pandemic has changed the way we use technology? So I think um, I'm really asking over here is that, do, do you think we'll see a permanent shift in the way people use technology after the pandemic? Stephanie? Yes, uh, I do think that there has been and will be a real and permanent shift uh, that has happened in 2020. I think digital consumers are here to stay. As you mentioned, more people have come online. Uh, in Southeast Asia, 40 million came online in uh, 2020. This takes us to 400 million uh, digitally connected across the region. That's a digital penetration rate of 70%. So we have a lot more people online, but it's not just that, we actually added new digital consumers as well. And by digital consumers, I mean people who are purchasing uh, online. They are subscribing also uh, to goods and services online. And when we look at digital consumers, we see that any category, whether it be electronics, groceries, uh, et cetera, within any of those categories, about 36% of the digital consumers are new as a result of uh, 2020 and as a result of COVID. What our uh, research is telling us though, is that these new digital consumers did not churn when lockdowns or circuit breakers ended. Uh, our companies across the region tell us they're sticking, uh, if you will. Also, we see that uh, digital consumption is happening in a more frequent pattern. There are more frequent purchases, if you will, uh, being used more for our daily lives, uh, purchasing essential items, uh, everyday items like groceries. And consumers tell us that they find this to be efficient, and nine out of 10 of them also tell us that they plan to continue using some of the digital services that they were new to in 2020. So that's on the consumer side. But if we also look on the business side, what we see too is an incredible acceleration of businesses coming online. This is large businesses that have started transforming themselves to have a digital presence, but it's also your SMEs, your small businesses uh, that are starting to and have uh, throughout the year digitized at a much faster rate as well. So they're trying to meet this new demand. So you have an ecosystem that has been accelerated in the last year. So what we thought would happen in four to five years actually happened in one year. So COVID may have been what led people to come online and maybe it's what had them consuming for the first time, but it's helpfulness that has them staying. Interesting. So I think on this is that uh, for sure, some things that we can see you know, as like day-to-day -day consumer there's an increased usage of like food delivery. You know, uh, we watch a lot of Netflix. So uh, maybe on more for Adash and uh, Rohit, maybe Adash first. Uh, is, is there any trends, you know, coming out from this pandemic uh, that is interesting and not obvious to many of us? Yeah, um, maybe on, 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 the, on the personal side, you know, one and then, and, and then maybe a reflection on, on how we work. On the personal side, I, you know, we're now doing Zoom calls with extended family across three continents and having to teach uh, grandparents how to use Zoom, uh, which has been fun. And I think uh, and uh, it will stay. Uh, it's quite, it's quite, quite, uh, quite an experience. I think on, on the, uh, you know, uh, how we work, I think, you know, I, I, uh, as, a, as a consultant, I'm, I'm used to two or three flights a week all around the region. Uh, and it's uh, amazing to, to work from home. Uh, I think you know if we are able to translate uh, our effectiveness and productivity over the last six months, um, uh, you know, going forward, I think it, it it can bode very well for integration across Southeast Asia and the way that we work uh, across ASEAN. Um, you know, we're already you know very well connected, but this can only help uh, it go even deeper uh, as we work across borders more seamlessly without um, having to travel as much. And I think a lot of uh, our clients and, and a lot of companies are actually thinking about, you know, how uh, ways of working will shift and how do we capitalize on this and, and you know, get the best of both worlds. Rohit, your view? Oh. Yeah, so I mean, just echoing partly what Adarsh said, I think one thing that uh, I can say that I'm itching to get back to the office and work in the office. 
But one thing that, uh, so I think that will get back to normal for me post the pandemic. But clearly travel is gonna change. Business travel for all of us is gonna change. I know there's not a pent up demand for letter travel. All of us can't wait to get out. But I know of almost every company I talk to is already in next year's budgeting cycle saying that they're cutting their travel budgets by 50% because they just don't feel people need to travel as much as they did earlier from a business perspective. Uh, the other, I think, big thing is that this pandemic is going to change the concept of businesses being digital or not digital. I think every business has realized that they need to, be, need to have a digital strategy. Um, and I think that is a big change. Uh, you're seeing that all over the world, even in, uh, in the U.S., you're seeing companies like um, Amazon and Target uh, growing GMV with triple digits. Sorry, I meant uh, Walmart and Target growing in triple digits. And Amazon will probably open more stores this year than any other physical outlet. So the digital world is becoming a reality. And I think all companies are realizing that uh, there is no such thing as only a digital business or non-digital business. So I think these are some changes I think we see uh, post the pandemic. Super interesting. So I think that uh, 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 one of the things that I saw in, in the report, it's uh, online travel. And a lot of our, you know, uh, readers and audience always have a lot of uh, uh, concerns and questions about online travel because it's one of the worst heat tech verticals, right? So in the report, uh, it is stated that uh, last year, 34 billion in terms of GMV, and this year, 14 billion in GMV, and that's like a 58% drop. So on one hand, we're seeing um, a huge drop in terms of like GMV and uh, obviously uh, spending, but at the same time, we're seeing, we're, we're you know hearing that like uh, travel unicorn. Traveloka is nearly profitable despite COVID-19, right? On top of that, um, out of like 10 respondents, seven, six to seven of the respondents say that they can't wait to travel. So on top of that, I think uh, Adash, uh, you mentioned that, uh, uh, you know, travel and of course Rohit as well, uh, business travel is going to, uh, you know, be dampened. So overall, what are your thoughts on online travel industry? And what are some of the opportunities for founders that are up for grabs as the world gets back to its usual travel schedule? Hmm. I can kick it off. You know, I think two thoughts. One is, uh, you know, just even understanding what has happened this year. Uh, obviously a big you know drop as you as you highlighted in uh, in the online travel sector but when you you know uh, uh, disaggregate it into the different subsectors um, you, there's actually some bright spots so one of the bright spots is uh, domestic travel um, international travel as we all understand from the restrictions has you know it's uh, going to take a while before it comes back but domestic travel uh, has opened up and in some of the markets that are you know less hit or or have not fully locked down like uh, Vietnam or Indonesia, actually, it's a it's a bright spot. Um, the other aspect of it is, you know, hotels versus flights. So a lot of the platforms that have actually a good inventory of uh, of hotels and and uh, places to stay, they are much better positioned because that has started to open up and and there's more more business uh, in terms of uh, just travel, domestic travel and and hotel bookings. So I think that's that's one of the things just to understand this year. As we look ahead, uh, it, it all depends on, on, on you know, how long it takes us for us to, for us to come out of, uh, of the crisis, for how long it takes for the situation to improve. Um, our forecasts are you know, currently based on a, a gradual recovery over next year. We expect that at least uh, the domestic travel and the hotels uh, segment, et cetera, should be you know, in a better position up to pre-COVID levels or, or recovered by 22. International travel might even take uh, by to the end of that year or 23 to actually get fully recovered. That's just one scenario and, and, and it'll all depend on and what happens with, uh, with the pandemic. Uh, but we, you know, I, I would say your question on what are the opportunities that, that open up? I think a lot more focus on on the domestic customer segments, which may have been somewhat underserved or, or not not as much given as much importance, given uh, you know maybe higher value international travelers. So that's that's uh, you know promising. The other aspect is that a lot more of uh, travel and, and travel platforms and, and players are focused on experiences uh, and, and innovating. You know what kinds of experiences uh, people might enjoy, like. Uh, a flight to nowhere, which you, know, you may not have thought of as an enjoyable experience in the past. Uh, so that's that's good as well as as uh, you know um, the the industry uh, you know uh, really comes up with new ideas uh, to innovate on on experiences. Thank you so much, uh, Stephanie. Uh, yes, in, in the uh, 
question about uh, what's up for grabs. You know, Rohit mentioned uh, business travel, and I do think that there is going to need to be a reimagination of, of business travel. And I, that's that's certainly in my mind up for grabs. I do believe that companies will do as as, as mentioned earlier, pull back on the necessity of as at least much business travel has been taking place in the past few years. On the personal side uh, of things, we see that a driver, which has always been important uh, in travel, is price. Uh, and price comparison has, has been an important part of shopping for travel uh, for a very long time. But we have now not just price sensitivity, but we have a high level of uncertainty. So I think those who are traveling for personal reasons and for vacations are going to be thinking more about safety. Uh, the hygiene in, in, in a hotel, uh, the cleanliness uh, of the places that they're going. Uh, so companies or whether it's startups or existing travel companies incorporating that into the equation, uh, but also flexibility. Uh, so COVID has left a lot of people maybe feeling burned by not getting refunds uh, when they had to cancel a trip or couldn't make a trip. So reimbursement or the flexibility uh, around rescheduling is, uh, I, I think, going to be important. Also, uh, you know, we've talked about it as outdoors, um, but I think it's really just how do you have or uh, provide for more vacations that are away from people? Uh, so things that uh, those who are traveling can maybe not do uh, or won't do as, as frequently as they did before in crowded spaces, uh, big cities. So having uh, that into the equation will be important. And lastly, local. That's what Adash was just saying about domestic tourism. I think even when we are at a you know, full recovery, uh, if you will, that there will still be this uh, localism that lasts with us. Uh, it's a behavior that's been adopted in the short term, uh, but is likely to linger for some time. So building out that domestic ecosystem will be important. Yeah, I think that's like uh, actually very insightful. So um, besides just looking at like online travel, it's like moving people from point A to point B, but it's also about making people feel comfortable, right? And um, secure and safe. So uh, you mentioned about making sure that things are clean. And, and again, I presume that the insurance space would be pretty interesting as well to make sure that people feel, you know, like comfortable uh, when it comes to like travel. So uh, Rohit, what's your, your thoughts on this? Well, I mean, Stephanie's come up with so many good ideas. I was taking notes so that I could start uh, businesses around those ideas. Um, so I don't think I can add much to what she said. Um, you did raise the point about uh, uh, profitability and Traveloka. Uh, so look, uh, I think two things. One is the fact that they managed to raise funding uh, even in the middle of the pandemic shows that people still believe in the long-term potential of the sector. Uh, and I think secondly, again, it's not just in travel, but across businesses, it has focused all businesses to look at a path to profitability and see how businesses can be sustainable. And I think, uh, so I think those are the only things I would add. Otherwise, I think both Adarsh and Stephanie have covered this quite well. Yeah, thanks a lot. So we definitely get into um, profitability later in this conversation. So I want to move on to um, Indonesia and Vietnam because the reports showed that Indonesia and Vietnam internet economies has raised the hit. Uh, why have they been able to do so well and so much better than other countries in Southeast Asia? So, uh, Rohit? Well, if you look at just this year in particular, I think just purely from a growth perspective, you know, the e economic growth perspective, these two countries have, are holding up better than most of the rest of the region. Uh, Vietnam probably is going to be in fact, will be the only country in Southeast Asia that expects to have positive GDP growth this year. Um, Indonesia is also expected to be down only one or two percent. So relative to other economies, I think they've held up better. But it's also not just a question of this year. Even if you look at the last couple of years, we have seen Indonesia and Vietnam really leading the front on the internet economy out here and having the maximum potential. And I, I attribute that to probably two reasons. Uh, you know, Indonesia is clearly the largest market in the region uh, by far, and therefore attracts a lot more capital and a lot more players out there. And that itself helps drive the ecosystems, make sure there are enough players, there's enough infrastructure being built, whether it's sort of payments, logistics, et cetera. There's just a lot of capital going in out there to facilitate that. And I think that helps Indonesia. Uh, Vietnam, you've seen one of the areas where uh, it's doing really well as an e-commerce. 
And just as a country, you have many more uh, manufacturing companies in Vietnam that serve, in fact, not just Vietnam, but the world. But because you have a lot of SMEs out there, I mean, it's a natural place for them to also look to sell online. And uh, even before formal e-commerce came in out there, social commerce has been pretty big in Vietnam. You know, people just selling stuff on Facebook and other sites like that. So I think there were some natural things out there uh, which have caused trends over the last few years to be very positive for both markets. And this year in particular, you also had the benefit of more resilient economic growth compared to some other markets in the region. That's very interesting. So um, for sure, I think uh, Vietnam is especially interesting um, for this year. And also I think in the report, there's like a new added unicorn, VN Life. And, you know, I think just to add on uh, to the question of like why Indonesia and Vietnam have such a breakout year. So uh, back to you, Adash, like uh, your thoughts, I think specifically, I think the Indonesia story has been like told quite well. I want to maybe pick your thoughts more on like uh, Vietnam. Well, you know, like where, where, where the growth is really coming from. And also at the same time, are there any opportunities that, uh, uh, you know, founders should actually look out for? Um, I, I think, you know, uh, first, of course, uh, you know, Rohit has covered uh, quite, quite a lot of the, the key points and maybe just a, a few small things to add. One is, you know, Vietnam is also quite interesting from a uh, tech talent perspective. Uh, and we, we talk about that being uh, one of the big enablers that, you know, still needs to be unlocked. Um, but over the past, you know, several years, it's, it's built up a nice, uh, um, you know, hub of, of tech talent, um, which will continue to serve it uh, well in terms of driving the growth. I think the second thing is that, uh, you know, Vietnam has had a, a, a very good run uh, in terms of developing the homegrown uh, players. Uh, and that starts to see a flywheel effect. So once you have, you know, the local, you know, wallets and, and e-commerce companies and gaming companies, a few of them succeed, that attracts a lot more, uh, you know, youth to say, yeah, that's, that's something I can do as well. And, and, and a lot more energy uh, to go after that. Um, so, you know, a few early wins and successes uh, will go a long way in, in kind of getting that flywheel going with a lot more people interested to, to set up digital businesses, to innovate um, and, and to try. Um, so I think those, those two are, are, are kind of quite interesting for me, uh, you know, beyond the points that, uh, that Rohit mentioned. And I continue to be very bullish um, in the future for, for Vietnam. Yeah, very interesting, like snowball effect uh, that's happening in the community uh, in Vietnam. Um, Stephanie? Yeah, I'll just uh, build, build upon uh, those good points. Uh, there has been lower internet penetration in both Indonesia and Vietnam in the past several years. Uh, so this year, Indonesia is about 60% and Vietnam is at 68%. And with those 40 million uh, new users coming online, the region is at 70%. But what that, uh, even though it's behind a bit, it's been growing quickly in the past few years. So if I go back to the first year that we published this report, it was in 2016, but based off of 2015 data, we estimated then that the 2015 to 20 uh, CAGR uh, for online or new users coming online would be 19% uh, for Indonesia and 13 for Vietnam, which was much higher than any of the, the other countries in Southeast Asia. So in more connected markets like uh, Singapore and Malaysia, it was just single digit uh, growth expected in terms of online users. But it is not just that the last few years have seen higher growth in terms of new users. It's what has happened as a result um, of that greater connectivity. So with that came a high smartphone base. Uh, and that is a difference from some of those countries that were connected earlier on. So in Vietnam alone, we see about 56 million uh, smartphones and you know, a population of 96 million, that's pretty significant. And so with that connectivity, with a high smartphone base came exactly what Adarsh just is talking about in Vietnam as an example, is this tech and digital entrepreneurialism. So that exists uh, as Rohit described in Indonesia and in Vietnam uh, as well. And so building on that tech talent point uh, that was made in Vietnam is that they have a strong developer ecosystem. Uh, three to 400,000 developers alone uh, in Vietnam and that has led to there being a hot spot in mobile gaming uh, as an example. Also, uh, it's a, a culture of export. So a lot of the e-commerce and social commerce that was referred to, they also export out of the country. 
So you have this uh, focus, uh, if you will, uh, that, about on tech, uh, tech talent that came with connectivity. Uh, so those things combined really fueled uh, the digital ecosystem in both of those countries. Yeah, so uh, we talk a lot about like online travel, we talk about Indonesia and Vietnam. So I just wanna move on to conversation um, on like digital financial services. So there's obviously a lot of buzz around um, DFS, um, also you know, known as like FinTech uh, in recent years, right? So the report, uh, one of the numbers that really stood out predicts that digital payment alone will reach 1.2 trillion in value by 2025. So, however, we know that there's a sizable, you know, underbanked or unbanked population in the region, of which some of them may not be comfortable with using technology. So I think here's the question, right? Like, will digital financial services truly help to offer equitable access to banking services? And what are some of the companies that you think are on the right track to capture this opportunity? Adash, me? Um, so I, I think a couple of uh, points, you know, there's a, there's a, a kind of a positive side and, and, a, and, a, and a call to action at the same, uh, same time. So on the positive side, uh, you know, I definitely do feel very strongly that digital financial services is, uh, is going to create a, is already creating and is going to create a very big impact uh, for the underserved um, and, uh, you know, the unbanked segments as well. Um, you know, it has the potential to really bring uh, millions of consumers into the financial system and really help them uh, in a big way, whether it is, you know, in, in the form of uh, helping consumers save and, and manage their finances better or to for small businesses. So I think that the potential is huge and, and in particular with uh, payments, there's a lot more uh, users coming on board, uh, you know, into the digital financial services uh, ecosystem. At the same time, you know, we had highlighted uh, even in our work last year where we uh, launched the, the research into digital financial services that uh, it cannot be the, the panacea, particularly for the unbanked. Uh, you know, there's a lot more work needed, uh, particularly from regulators, uh, from established financial services players, from, uh, you know, telecom providers to, you know, create the access to really, uh, you know, um, have uh, the right impact for that segment. So just by itself, the fintech players are not going to be able to serve that segment uh, effectively uh, without, uh, you know, other interventions and other uh, moves that are made because the, it's hard uh, to make any money. And, and a lot of the fintech players will be first focused on the underbank uh, rather than the unbanked over the next three to five years. So our, our view last, last year was that it's gonna take more time because it is more, more difficult. So maybe not in the, the next five year horizon, but the five year horizon after that, we, you'll really see the unbanked uh, population that we call today um, coming into, into the, the consuming uh, uh, you know, set. So it's, it's just gonna take a bit longer and, and uh, a lot of that will depend on, on what the regulators do. So I think that's that's kind of one one aspect to it. I think you know the the companies uh, in terms of you know which companies are really doing doing good job. I think both the the digital payment uh, uh, you know wallet providers uh, uh, and the you know uh, digital payment space itself, all of the companies there are actually uh, making you know different steps uh, to bring more people into the uh, into the financial system, um, be it just in terms of the you know, having a lot more points of sale across a lot more, you know, uh, physical and offline merchants, uh, be the ease of uh, use of, of, uh, of payments. Um, you know, the e-commerce is the other one, which is, you know, starting to go down uh, quite far uh, into these underserved segments in terms of trying to, you know, uh, creating options for them uh, uh, together with financing. Uh, so to be able to buy uh, things and, and make them more affordable. So both of those sectors as a whole, you know, I don't think that, you know, there's some players who are doing, uh, you know, dramatically more or less than others, but actually most of the players participating in those are are actually making a, a big difference. So so I think combined, uh, those two will have the, the biggest impact in my view over the next few years. Interesting. Um, Stephanie? Well, we just heard from the financial services expert, so I am not sure what I could uh, add to that except uh, to agree. Uh, I do think that digital payments will provide for more equitable access to banking services, uh, but it's going to take uh, some time, particularly on, on the portion that I'm, I'm personally uh, excited about, and that is given uh, those in rural areas that are uh, not just underbanked but unbanked today. 
uh, the ability to participate in a global financial system. And I think this is really important for Southeast Asia because of the percentage of those who are living uh, in rural areas. So the more we can or the faster we can develop this, I think it would be good so that they can, yes, uh, have access uh, to, to financial uh, services, but also participate uh, more equitably in the digital economy as well. As for uh, companies uh, who are doing this, uh, doing this well, I, I'm quite interested in, in following those that are aiming to close their own uh, ecosystem, if you will. Uh, so whether it's a ride hailing company that offers a pay option or whether it's an e-commerce company uh, like Shopee. So whether it's AirPay, Shopee Pay, uh, all under the umbrella of C-Money. Uh, so that you, again, can bring financial options to those who can or would like to participate in the uh, e-commerce space online. So quite, uh, quite interested there and see some good things happening. Yeah, I think that's a, a very interesting development, especially when you mentioned about C Group, uh, which have really uh, a phenomenal year, right? 80 billion or more than that, 90 billion in terms of like uh, market cap. Um, so Rohit, like, what are your thoughts in terms of like digital financial services? I'm particularly interested uh, to know your thoughts in terms of like, what are some of the companies that you think are on the right track to capture this opportunity? Look, there's clearly a lot of capital going into this segment because people see this as the next big thing in Southeast Asia. You had about $1.7 billion of funding that went into uh, FinTech companies in 2019. And if you look at the numbers for the first half of this year, you're on track to sort of exceed that uh, on a pro rata basis. Um, and I think that also understates the amount of capital because this only accounts for money that's going into what are classified as fintech companies. There are a lot of financial services being pursued by you know, companies like C Group, by companies like Gojek, you know, that have multiple businesses and they are investing into financial services too. So actually there's a lot of money going into it. Uh, I particularly think that the e-commerce companies are in a unique position out here because they have a lot of transaction data, relevant transaction data. And whereas the you know, pay later products or you know, serving the consumers is one thing, I think the big value is also actually in using that data to be able to lend to the SMEs out there. That's a segment which you know, doesn't have easy access to capital. And that's a segment that uh, can make a dramatic difference to their fortunes if they have access to capital. And today, uh, the data that these e-commerce companies are getting should put them in a good position to be able to address that gap. That's something I'm really looking forward to. Yeah, there seems to be some parallel, right? In terms of like uh, the, uh, the success of Alibaba and of course like N Financial. So it does seem to like a lot of talks on like e-commerce uh, and digital financial services, uh, be it your Tokopedia, your Shopee, or even Bukalapa and Lazada. So I think that would be obviously super exciting and uh, for sure, I think one to watch. So, uh, you know, moving on, I think uh, what COVID uh, has done, you know, is you know, essentially changed the conditions, right, uh, in the market. So I really want to ask, like, have the conditions to be a successful tech startup changed since the outbreak of COVID-19? And are investors increasingly demanding that tech companies become profitable? I think we, man we, we mentioned a little bit of that. And how can founders balance growth versus profitability? I think, Rohit, if you could start. I think I distinguish between stage of company, right? So if you're an early startup, you know, seed funding, Series A at that point of time, I think at that time, the key thing you're focused on is getting traction with your clients and making sure you have a value proposition that res resonates as adding value. You know, at that point, probably profitability isn't as important. You at least have to find out whether you've got a product that has a need and you're serving customers uh, who value that uh, product. But once you cross that stage, you know, beyond series B, for example, you know, the unit economics become important. People want to see whether you really have a path to profitability. So which is why you'll see that, look, series A, series B funding continues to be very robust there's not really much an issue. Because at that point of time, people are all they're looking for, do you have a large addressable market? Do you have a product that's sort of serving a need? And do you have a management team that can deliver on it? After that, people are then looking to see, okay, once you have that traction, you know, do you really have the ability to make this a sustainable business? And I think there's a lot more focus on that today. Uh, and that's why you're seeing 
Series C, Series D funding plateauing because if you've got a robust business model uh, with a proven path to profitability, there's no issue getting funding. But uh, not every company in that segment can get funding now just because they're having growing users or growing GMV. That's really interesting. Uh, Stephanie, your view? I, I do not have uh, a thing to add uh, to that. Uh, I, well, well covered. I, I would just say that as, as founders are, are, whether they're current founders or looking uh, to, to start a company is, yes, while profitability is maybe under new lens, today to not shy away from taking risk and don't shy away from reinvesting profits in order to achieve uh, growth. But as Rohit just uh, so well said, uh, to be honest about the performance to plan or the plan to profitability that is, uh, don't just you know, be, be blind to, to keep, you know, reinvesting and reinvesting uh, to achieve uh, growth. There needs to be a clear path to, to profitability, but still opportunity to take risk uh, today because there is the capital available. Yeah, um, just to add on, right, before I pass to uh, Adash, uh, I think what's interesting is that uh, almost every unicorn, right, in, in Southeast Asia are talking about like the path to profitability. And I think that's actually pretty refreshing um, because like in, instead of like growth at all costs, I think a lot more um, of these companies are actually thinking about sustainability and uh, the path to profit. So maybe to Adash, I think just to add on like uh, one, just one more additional point uh, or rather question is that uh, out of all the companies that you have seen or rather the 12 unicorns that you have, uh, that, that we have seen in, in the report, like which company are you most bullish on in terms of like the path to profitability? <laughs> Tough one. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> that 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 is a that is a tough one. Um, I I would probably say uh, you know maybe not not so much uh, paths to profitability, but but sustainable economics. Uh, um, I I actually think the the I'm still quite bullish on the e-commerce uh, players. Um, even though they may not, uh, you know, they may go several years with, uh, you know, razor thin uh, margins as they continue to invest. Uh, but just, it, you know, the, the scale is uh, that they're getting to now uh, is, is quite helpful to, to set up, you know, unit economics in a, in a more sustainable way. And, uh, you know, hopefully, as you said, I fully agree with you that it's healthy to, to kind of shift uh, uh, to, to focus on profitability. A lot, uh, one aspect which we didn't talk about is just consumer behavior, right? I think we are extremely spoiled uh, uh, as consumers. So, so that's a bit risky for the longer term. So it's good to have this, this correction and, and uh, you know, get, get many of these companies on a track that they can keep growing for decades rather than uh, burn out. Yeah, thanks a lot. That's uh, obviously a tough one for you. Uh, but yeah, I, I think in general, it's a it's, it's good point. E-commerce, proven model. Uh, and also I think most importantly is that it's a market that continues to grow and adding on like new uh, internet users. So for sure, I think I'm pretty bullish on, on, on that front for sure. All right, so uh, to end it off, I'm gonna ask like uh, an interesting question uh, starting from like uh, Steph. So if you were to be an entrepreneur, what problem will you be tackling in Southeast Asia and why? So start off with Stephanie, Rohit, and then finally Adash. Steph, please. Thank you. It's fun to uh, daydream a little bit. And I think the, the, the key there in your question is, if I were an entrepreneur, uh, I I'm, I'm really admire those who are. Uh, but if I were, uh, sustainability uh, would be my focus uh, and sustainability in the environmental sense. And the reason is, you know, as a result of COVID, there is so much focus on economic recovery. And there should be, uh, absolutely. Uh, that is, is incredibly important. But I'm just personally afraid that sustainability is going to be brushed aside in that pursuit of economic recovery. But we've got to look, we've got to think, and we've got to plan further around the corner. A short-term recovery is not going to matter in the long run if we don't curb some of the impact from, from climate change uh, and other. So I think it's actually a, a perfect time. We're reinventing ourselves a bit uh, after COVID, uh, so let's tackle sustainability. And I think that there's a good opportunity there. If I were an entrepreneur, I'd love to focus it. Cool. 
That's nice. Uh, Rohit? Um, I would probably uh, look to do something in health tech, healthcare technology, digital health. And the reason for that is that it's a very large market. There's a clear need here in Southeast Asia where we're very short of both doctors and hospital beds. It's probably on a global basis, one of the least digitized industries. So there's a huge opportunity from that perspective. Um, and it's a pretty clean sheet of paper here in Southeast Asia. I mean, there are a few good startups, but they're all very early. So uh, business models are still developing. So you can start with a reasonably clean sheet of paper and uh, try and figure out uh, you know, your way through the industry. Um, you know, I think the important thing, uh, and again, I'm not an entrepreneur, but from what I've seen, for the successful ones, you've got to, particularly if you go into uh, a new industry or something that's sort of being reshaped, you just have to be willing to pivot. So I don't know how it will shape out, but it's early enough in its development here that I think you can actually pivot and find the right outcome for you and uh, find a niche for yourself. So I'm, I'm excited about that area. Yeah, I think that's a good pitch. Uh, Adash. Great. I mean, first of all, I just want to say that I'm extremely tempted so uh, uh, to actually become an entrepreneur. And I want to allude to, uh, allude to our, our research, which shows there's $11.9 billion of dry powder with the VC firms uh, as of last year. So there's a lot of capital out there, as Roy alluded to before. You know, it's a dearth of actually good ideas and smart people who are passionate about pursuing that. It's not, it's not the uh, shortage of capital. Um, so, you know, first of all, that, that's kind of the first point. I think the, you know, which area, lot, lots to choose from. Uh, I, I'm, I'm personally um, quite active in, in two areas, so it'll probably be those or, or a combination. One is FinTech. Um, you know, uh, FinTech continues to be, you know, have lots of upside, lots of problems to be solved. Uh, you know, cross-border, small business, uh, personal financial management, so quite quite exciting. Um, the other area that I do quite a lot of work in is food systems, uh, which is quite uh, close to to uh, you know some of the topics that Stephanie was talking about in terms of sustainability and and how do we uh, take our food systems into the future. Um, there's a very interesting intersection uh, where you know in, in a conference I attended recently there was a comment around the trillions of dollars in the financial services uh, sector. And you know, why that is not put to work better to solve uh, the problems in 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 the in the planet. Uh, so, so I think that would be probably the areas that uh, that I would be looking at. Nice. So, I guess like any investors that are listening to you know you can try to convince like these three very very smart uh, <laughs> professionals to you know convert and become an entrepreneur. Yeah. But thanks a lot for sharing. So uh, I think that's all the time that we have for today. Uh, I really, really have a very good discussion and I learned so much. Thank you so much, Stephanie, Adash, and also Rohit for your time. Uh, you know, I wish I could just continue talking, uh, but this is all we have. And once again, thank you so much for tuning in and thank you so much for Switch for this, for this opportunity to you know, uh, speak with uh, everyone and also you know, talk a lot more about uh, the report. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.